Hey everyone, it's Pastor James. Thanks for joining us for this uh, Digging Deeper episode. Uh, after a sermon each Sunday, we try to just uh, plumb the depths a little more of what the passage might mean, maybe something special that we can pull out of it. And this morning, I want to talk a little bit about the whole concept of repentance. So if you go back to the sermon I preached on Sunday, I preached a sermon based on Luke chapter 13, verses 6 to 9. Just a short little parable. It's called the parable of the fig tree. And I'd encourage you to go and read it um, if you get a chance. It'd take you all of about 30 seconds to read it. But the three main points I made coming out of that passage uh, were, first, um, I asked the question, what does it mean for us to live fruitful lives? Like, what does that actually mean? And the conclusion in a simple way that I drew was, it means living a godly life. The second um, point I made was uh, around the question of how, how do we actually uh, train ourselves to be more fruitful? And the third and final one was, how will your story end? Because just to revisit that parable, one interesting thing about it is at the very end, we're not told how it's resolved. We're told that on some time, more time, another year is given to the caretaker of the fig tree, that to nourish it and fertilize it and help it to grow, but we're not told the outcome. So for each of us, I think there's a, a real point uh, about our own endings. This is a time of grace we live in where we're being nurtured and fed and supported and given care. How will we respond? Will we be the kind of people who respond and live um, godly lives? Will we bear fruit or will we fail to bear fruit? There's that kind of question hanging over the end. I want to talk a little bit about this whole concept of repentance though. So if you go right back to the beginning of Luke 13, you'll notice that from Luke all the way from verse 1 to verse 9 is about repentance. There's three stories. The third one is the parable of the fig tree. But at the beginning of Luke, there are two other stories. And the disciples are asking Jesus about um, some things that have happened in the area. The first one, I'll just read it to you because it's uh, important. It says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, who, whose blood Pilate had mixed with the sacrifices. And Jesus, so imagine the disciples are asking about them and about their fate and about what happened to them. And Jesus actually turns to the disciples and says, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because of the way they suffered? He says, I tell you, no, they were no worse or no better, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Then he goes on to a second story. He says, or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, Jesus says, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And then he goes on and tells the parable of the fig tree. Now, I think one of the main points Jesus is making about repentance in the stories, those two stories that lead up to the parable of the fig tree, is he's trying to say, look, it doesn't matter if you're super bad, kind of bad, kind of good, really good. Natural disasters happen. The key point is for you not to compare disasters to people's moral worth or their moral uh, performance, but to ask yourself, have I repented? Because it doesn't matter if how they died, the Jesus is calling everyone in this case to repentance. You know, it's, the, the words in this passage come off as harsh. We often think of Jesus as uh, more uh, meek and mild, but these are some of what one uh, biblical scholar says are some of Jesus' most ferocious words. Now, I just want to talk about the repentance part for a moment because we tend to equate repentance with personal decisions to turn our lives. But there's a layer of this that has to do with the national repentance, the, the repentance of the, the, the nation of Israel. And here's what I mean by that. The nation of Israel is careening down the wrong road. Jesus, as God's representative and Messiah, comes and says, look, the kingdom has come. Join in, reign with the king, begin a new way of life, turn, with your, to turn from your old way of life, the way that's just not working, it's unfruitful, it's destructive. You're not living according to the way that God wanted you to live. You can even look back into the Old Testament to see that you as a people have fallen away from your purpose. You need to turn to me 
and change the way you're living your life. So do you see there's an element there that's addressing the whole people, the Jews, to say, there's a new way. You need to join in on it and turn away from your old ways. And you'll see that throughout the New Testament. Now, in Luke, interestingly enough, though, he moves beyond, I think, just national repentance, and he moves right down to the level of the individual. Because the parable seems to indicate that the vineyard is, uh, which was con uh, referred to or, or uh, which represented in the Old Testament often, the vineyard represented Israel. The vineyard here could represent the nation, but Luke is pressing down further to say, no, there's more here though. There are individual Galileans who died at the mercy of Pilate. And there are individuals who, who die, individuals who died when the Tower of Siloam fell. I want, Jesus is saying, to talk to you about the individual fig trees that are populating this vineyard. And there seems to be then, with Luke, pushing right down to the individual. What would it mean for us, for me, for you, for others today, to repent? Without losing the fact that there is a sense in the background that there's a new way of life that the whole nation was called to. Here's what I think it represents. When Jesus says, my kingdom, or the two, two, uh, my kingdom is not of this world, and when he says things like, um, Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, he's calling the people uh, around him to lay down their old way of living and to begin a new life with him. Now, that has to involve giving up old practices, sinful practices, that were moving in the wrong direction. Jesus says that, if you will trust me and follow me, I'll put my easy yoke on you and we'll walk together and I'll train you and show you how to live this kingdom life together. So when we think primarily of repentance for the individual, I think it's a retraining process. We have to be, be willing to be directed and guided by, in this case, um, a master. And we can, be, we can call ourselves then the disciples of the master or the apprentices of the master. But we look to the master to show us the new way of living, the kingdom life. And when I say the kingdom life, we remember kingdom doesn't refer to a place. It refers to a reign. So God is now reigning in a new way in Jesus' ministry. And he's asking us and inviting us to come and join him in that. In order to do that, I and you will have to turn away from our old ways accept the new way that the Messiah gives us, go into the easy yoke and train with him. And it's through that we'll begin to learn and train and um, what uh, in my sermon, St. Augustine called to, to train in love, to, sh to learn how to love God and love others well. So that's a little piece just about repentance. I think it's worth thinking about. Now, we often think of repentance or hear repentance as something um, really harsh on e our, our ears, that someone is judgmental. They're calling out my sin because I'm not uh, living the right way. You know what? There's an element of that that's true. But the invitation here is really on getting our whole life aligned with becoming more like Jesus so that we can turn away from the things that were destructive, that are not helping us, that recognize ourselves, put ourselves at the center of the universe rather than um, Jesus, who we, we, we believe should be at the very center. So I hope that's helpful. It's a little bit about repentance. Um, Gail Ann's gonna come along today um, and she's gonna be dropping um, some ideas around a practice uh, minute that'll give you a chance to practice a little bit of what we learned in the sermon. There'll be some questions that follow. The questions that come out of the sermon are designed for you to reflect on and for your small group to use, and hopefully they'll give you a chance to talk through uh, what the sermon was about and apply it to your own life. That's all for me. I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much.